Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wednesday edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live right here on Giants.com and the Giants mobile app. Paul Dettino, John Schmelk with you. The phone number is 201-939-4513. We are going to get to your calls today early and often. If you want to go get our full take on that initial 53-man roster or 52-man roster that got released yesterday, go to the Giants Huddle podcast feed or go to the Giants YouTube channel. You will see our reaction video, and we go through it position by position, and we do a detailed analysis. So if you want to go check that out, you can go check that out. But we want to give you guys a chance to get in and talk about it on the phone. So give us a call, 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513. We're not going to go through that whole exercise again here because, again, you can listen to it on the other feed, Paul. But just what was your big picture reaction to it where you said, all right, this is kind of a theme or this is something that kind of stuck out to me? Well, it seems to me two things. Uh, number one, the Giants did place a lot of emphasis and value on special teams. That was my first reaction, too. They they understood that during the course of the offseason, they had not really upgraded their special teams in any significant way, and they clearly were not necessarily satisfied with what they saw during the last month. And so they, they kept a couple of guys here who I think are much heavier special teams values than positional values. We know that starting today at 12 o'clock, uh, you can now start making more roster moves, whether they be uh, waived guys who are now cleared at 12, uh, which you had to put in a claim for, or they could be free agents who were set free yesterday and are now totally mm-hmm. and readily available to resign uh, or assign to your practice squad uh, and or you can now make machinations after 12 involving your injured reserve list. Let me just get that part out of the way. Yep. So, yes, special teams clearly became a bigger emphasis than anybody might have thought. Uh, it was a concern of mine. Number two, Darian Beavers, who you had had some doubts. You had had some doubts. You said maybe he's a little closer to the bubble than people think. I still thought he'd be on, though. <laughs> I think we all did. I mean, this is and, and let me make something clear, folks. Beavers was being ramped up during training camp. He had had a serious ACL last year. He didn't even play in the first preseason game because he was did not up. play. Mm-hmm. And during practice, even though McFadden had gotten more reps and moved ahead of him because he had played well and and showed a lot more improvement since he did last year, Beavers was being paced. He was being being brought in slowly, much like Sterling Shepard was. So for us, we were like, all right, well, he's healthy. He's cleared, which is why he's not waived injured, by the way, because otherwise, you know, he could not be. Mm -hmm. So, So he's clearly healthy. But the ramp up, I don't know if that was supposed to be a hint to us or not because we didn't believe he was losing ground because of performance. We were under the impression that he was being ramped up because of recovery off of the injury. So when he landed on the waiver wire yesterday, that was the biggest surprise for me. Yeah, and I'll just say this. I think now it's interesting to see what happens with some of the guys that they did put on the active roster that are still banged up, right? And we don't know the extent of their injuries. I'll throw out some names here. Uh, Gary Brightwell, who has not played the last couple of preseason games. Yep. Nick McLeod, who has mm-hmm. not played in the last couple of preseason games. And Javarius Owens, who came out of the last preseason game with a hamstring. I DJ think Davidson, those too. are the three. He's, he's been banged up most of camp. Well, he's been one of the guys that have been ramping up, much like yes. Gary and Beaver. So, yes. you know, he's the guy that I think you take a look at it, and he's ramping up. So he's I don't think he's a guy that's an IR candidate or anything like that because he has practice in full for a couple of weeks. So I think he'll be okay. And Cam Brown's the other one. That's four guys Yes, that have been injured and have not been participating. How close are these guys to being ready to play? Will, anyone, will any one of them be put on that four-game IR? which will then open up a roster spot for somebody else. We don't know the answers to these questions. Right. So we'll see. There'll you, be movement today. You mentioned the waivers. Of course, if you have vested veterans that are four years or more, those are guys that you can kind of say, all right, we'll cut you day one, but we're going to bring you back tomorrow. No other teams can claim you because they don't hit waivers. So that's something to keep an eye on too. But those are the things that I'm curious to see today. And, and I mentioned only 52 guys. I know there's many reports about another potential move that has not been official yet. So when that becomes official, that becomes guy 53. Um, 
So that's where we are in terms of that. If you want to talk about that, we can too. Again, it's 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513 right here on Big Blue Kickoff Live on Giants.com and the Giants mobile app. Let's get right to the calls, folks. I told you I'd get to you early. Yep. We'll take calls all show long. If you want to hear our full reaction to the roster, go check out our Giants huddle post or go to the Giants YouTube channel. You can find our video on there as well. Let's go to... Eli in New York City. He will lead us off today. Eli. Hello. Um, my question is, even though Jalen Hyatt is not a starter, do you think he will be playing a lot? He is not going to technically be a starter, Eli, but I imagine he will be in the top three in terms of snaps per game for wide receivers. Maybe four, Paul? Easily four. Easily I four. don't know if he makes it to the third uh, snap count, but I think he'll easily be in the fourth snap count. And again, I don't think that's like fourth place in like 10% of the snaps. I think that would be like fourth place in like 30 to 40% of the snaps. And it wouldn't shock me by week four if that's closer to 70% of the snaps. Yeah. His, his development yeah. has been coming quickly. Yeah, he's like really quick, like as you saw in the touchdown against the Panthers. Yeah, absolutely, Eli. And again, th- thanks a lot for the call. And he's shown speed to get over the top, but it's been the other stuff, some of the nuance and the route running that we maybe didn't see on the college tape because of the system that Tennessee ran that I think has come along a lot faster, Paul, than I think a lot of people thought. I don't think there's any doubt. The Giants, uh, Brendan Brown, the assistant general manager, talked to us about a week ago and said, you know, that was our projection for him. We thought he would be capable of doing all of that stuff. And that came from talking to the coaching staff at Tennessee specifically. Right. They were using him to win games at the SEC level. Yeah, and run their system. And you can't mm-hmm. blame them for that. We talk all the time about this. With college players, those coaches are not in charge of developing NFL stars. They're in charge of winning games for their alums. <laughs> okay? Though I'm sure they do when they go recruiting. They do sell to these guys that we're going to get you of course a high it pick does. in the NFL. Of course it does. But that's based on usually reputation of program or alums who have then gone on to become bigger stars. Mm-hmm. They're not necessarily looking to prioritize the development of a college player into an NFL star. That's why, again, it's great that the coaches told the Giants people, we think he can do that stuff, but as far as implementation on the field, Jalen Hyatt was doing what Jalen Hyatt needed to do to help the Volunteers win, not to help his draft stock. And this goes back to, too, Brian Dable and the Giants front office staff knowing people around the league. And Brian Dable, specifically from his time as Alabama, has a lot of college connections as well. We talked about that a lot when Joe Judge was here, too, right? He had a lot of connections in college. So that helps getting that good intel. You're going to get you know, talk to people you know you can trust what they tell you. Mm-hmm. And that's how you can, you know, make bets like that. Let's go to Hugo in New Jersey. He's up next. Hey, Hugo. Hey, good morning, guys. What's up? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think Joe Shane has done a tremendous job of roster, roster construction. But as we discussed, I think, on various occasions during the off season, for this team to be really good, some of the young players on the roster need to make um, – you know, they're, they're take the next steps in their development. Sure. And uh, I, I, I've been tracking camp reports and uh, based on my own observations, I put players in two camps, disappointing and making progress. And unfortunately, in the disappointing camp are three players that we were all very high on during the off season. You already touched on Darian Beavers, but you know, that may be more injury-related, as you guys noted, than anything. Josh Azudu, which I can exp- – you can explain that away. He missed a lot of time last year, maybe had to, had to do some rehab in the off season. So I would think that he would improve as the season goes along. Now, the one that's the most perplexing to me is Cordell Flott. And I'm wondering, was, do you guys think he was miscast at the beginning of training camp as a slot corner? 100%. At- Hundred okay. percent. Don't so, even go any further. He's a boundary corner for me. Yeah, but with that said, even when he moved to the boundary, it's not like he was shutting people down left and right either. No. Yeah, well, yeah. That, 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 he needs more that, work. That one's a, yeah, that one's perplexing to me because he, he, I thought he was trending in the right direction last year, and he's got length and speed and movement skills. So 
uh, that's one to watch. Yeah, look, and, and, and he'll, he'll, he'll real fast. I just want to comment on those two things real fast before you hit your next point. Yeah, look, I agree. I think they've decided, based on what we've seen, his usage in practice, that he's a better outside guy than an inside guy. I think that's where you're going to see him moving forward. I think that's, frankly, why Darnay Holmes is probably on the roster still, because they see him as the backup slot, and they see Flat as more of a backup guy on the perimeter. So, agree with Paul on that 100%. Now we'll see how Flat develops as he plays more outside. Maybe he can give you something. And then the other thing I'll say, I, I wouldn't consider Azudu's training camp to be disappointing, to be honest. I wouldn't you. either. I wouldn't. Um, are you disappointed maybe that he did not outright seize one of those that spots thing. on the guard from yeah. like Bredesen or something like that? Yes. Yeah. But frankly, Hugo, I think that more has to do with Bredesen being better than I thought he was going to be than Azudu being disappointing, to be honest with you. Bredesen raised his level of play. I think so too. He okay. did. Okay. Oh, so that's that. That's a good reason why. Yes, yeah, exactly. Really yes. Okay, and, and then in the making progress category, I, I had the following players, and I, I like to ask you if if you agree or if I missed anyone. Yep. Uh, Daniel Jones, Evan Neal, Jason Pinnock, Dane Belton, Kayvon, and Micah McFadden. Micah McFadden, yes. Dane Belton, yes. I mean, Daniel, I guess, has looked better, but I, I'm not going to make a judgment call on him until I see bullets flying in, in games. Um, Evan Neal, yeah, I, I think he's looked a little bit better, but again, he missed a lot of time with the concussion, so I want to see more from him. Not enough sample size this yeah, summer. Yeah, I want to see more. Not enough to know. Not enough to know. Yeah, I, I think he did better overall in pass pro, especially in the one-on-ones, but again, I don't think we saw enough. You know, we didn't. I wish I would have seen him in the in the scrimmage yeah. against Detroit. That would have helped me a lot. Yeah, give me a better feel for him. I, I and I then agree. who who was the other guy that you said made progress? That yeah, I missed? yeah, yeah J, J, Jason Pinnock uh, adjusting to the same Pinnock, position. yes, clearly, and and and, 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 and Kayvon. Yeah, you know, Kayvon. I think the jury's out on that. I don't think I've seen, like, he hasn't looked like a significantly different player in this camp than he did last one. Yeah, and he didn't get a ton of game reps. No, he didn't. So I, I know he had, the, he had the one really good pressure against Aquanu. One, one, yep. one, mm. one, he was a free rusher. The other one, he actually beat him legitimately. So that was good to see. Uh, but again, I, I want to see Kayvon more in, in-game reps before I make the call on him. And I think, to be fair to Jones, I thought he had a terrific offseason last year, even though he was new to the Dable-Kafka system. And I think he's had another terrific offseason this summer. So, I don't know. is is Does that necessarily mean he's just at a really good high level and, and that's where he is? Or does that mean he's still going up? I mean, that remains to be seen once he gets more reps as well. But to John's point, Kayvon Thibodeau uh, barely played in these preseason games, and really to gauge his development, we're going to need to see him play. Okay. Did, did, did I did I miss anyone on that list, or is there any other guy that comes to mind mm, good that question. has taken a big step in their development? That you know, it's hard to track from the camp reports and stuff. And like you said, the snaps are somewhat limited. That at least the ones I can see, right, on TV. And I think Daniel I think Bellinger it. looks a little bit more. Um, well, we know he's increased his size and his strength. Now, yeah, until he until he gets into regular games and has the opportunity to start beating people up on the line or maybe carrying people after he makes a catch for some cool. yak yardage, until we get to see that, but I suspect, I suspect you will see a, a better Daniel Bellinger this year. I, again, I mentioned uh, I, this before, Hugo, and I, and I would throw Bredesen into that mix too, by the way. Just, I would. Brad yeah. Bredesen, Bredesen That's fair. and Bellinger. Those, are, those, those are two good ones. Okay, guys. Well, very good. Thank you. Yeah, and I think Mike and McFadden definitely. Uh, Pinnock, certainly. Mm-hmm. And I think Belton has had some good moments too. So those, I think, are probably... I'm looking at the roster here. I think those are the guys that I would kind of point a finger at. I think Hugo did a good job with his list. We could potentially throw Darius Slayton in there because he's had the best camp of his career. Okay. I mean, I, I'll i be frank with you. He's had some inconsistencies with dropsies, even last season. This training camp, he's done much better catching the ball. Yeah, I'd say that. Though I always think with drops, once you get into a game and you're worried about guys hitting you, that's when that's you really That's why I, I kind of put him there on the fringe no, because fair. we need to see him in games again. But he's had the best camp of his career. Yeah. 201-939-4513. Let's go to our buddy Charlie in Portland, Maine. Hi, Charlie. Hey, Paul. What's and up? Hey, John. 
How you guys doing? Go. Hey, good. I listened to the 53, and actually I'm watching it on uh, Roku TV. I know it's a little delayed on the TV, but it's fun doing it this way. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I digress. Hey, By the uh, way, if you I'm, go download the Giants TV streaming app, you can watch us on your digital uh, TV streaming right. service. There you go. Thank you for the pop, Charlie. I appreciate that. Hey, <laughs> hey, no problem. Hey, I'd like to listen to myself on TV. Oh, well, <laughs> we're not surprised by that at all. <laughs> hey, look, I was surprised at some of these moves. Uh, look, I, 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 I was surprised some of the guys they left on the 53, and I was surprised on some of the guys they let go. Uh, like Davidson, I don't know why he's on the 53, because I think they could have gone him on the practice squad. I don't think anybody was going to take him away. Uh, Charlie, Holmes, my though. feeling is that they, they they took the attitude of we're going to keep our best guys, and we don't want to risk another team claiming them, because frankly, it's just really hard to anticipate what other players' teams might like. What if, what if there's some team out there that had a fourth-round grade on DJ Davidson on their draft board two years ago when he got yeah. picked? And they're just ready to pluck him, even though he really hasn't played. So, right. I, yeah, but I he's coming off an ACL. No, I mean, I get it. Uh, you know, the chances. But anyway, I, let me I, just go I, through a I, few I'll guys. add this, though, Charlie. Seriously. Yeah, go ahead. And I, I, I don't want to delay you, but Marcus McKeithen's another one of those guys who, exactly. was, who was an important draft pick for this yep. team last year. They think mm -hmm. he's got a ton to offer, and we have seen very little from him in two years yeah. because of the injury, but they kept him. Yeah. Yeah. That was another guy on my list. I thought they shouldn't have kept him, you know, let him go to the practice squad. Uh, Cam Brown, I was surprised since he's been injured all the time. And I was surprised that Holmes, uh, Darnay Holmes was on the roster. Uh, guys that I was surprised that they let go. Beavers, I do not think is going to make it through. And Waivers. Charlie, and Charlie, just real quick. I, I, I'll just yeah. repeat what I said earlier on the, uh, on the Holmes thing. Yeah. I just think that they didn't really have anyone else that they felt good about playing inside at nickel corner um, yeah. they, on the roster. So I think they decided that they needed him because of that. McCain yeah. played some nickel with Washington, and yet the no, Giants you know have decided the Giants must have decided that Holmes is still better off than McCain in that spot. Yeah, they just haven't played McCain in that Not much. spot in camp a whole lot. I don't think they view him you know, that I, way. I've been pushing McCain as that all summer, but they just really, I mean, look, as a safety, you're going to move down there sometimes, yeah. and they have done that with he him. He had but, experience doing but it. But he, he always is with the safeties when he's doing his drills, and he, he will be in the slot as a safety, but he really hasn't played that slot corner spot yet. No. So, so they must right. not think that that's really a good place for him. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's going to be a pickup, but I don't know. And I was surprised that they took Wandell off pop, and then listening to Wandell saying that I'm, you know, I'm gearing up, hoping for the first week. It was kind of like it didn't sound that confident <laughs> that he was going to be ready for the first week. Well, Charlie, it's, you know, it sounds to me he got activated, so he would, you know, even if he's active in week one, you know, he's not going to play a ton of snaps. That's a, that's mm. the where they're going to work him in. But maybe they yeah. think by week two or week three he could be 100%, and they wanted to make sure he was yeah. able to play in, in week three and week four. That's got to be yeah. the reason because yeah. they really believe in their heart of hearts he'll be ready before yeah. four weeks. Otherwise, if you left him on right. pop, Earliest he could play is week five. Yeah, so my other guys, uh, that Fox, I was surprised that they let him go. Yeah, us too. Uh, and uh, Sills, I wasn't totally surprised, but he played really well. I think the Jets will pick him up. <laughs> I mean, they saw him play, and they need some wide receivers because they got some injuries. Wouldn't surprise me if he goes to the Jets. And the other guy that I was really surprised is Tyree Phillips. He played fairly well last year. I think he was our best reserve offensive lineman, and we let him go, and we kept Pert, uh, which I know, Paul, you thought you were high on him, but I, I didn't see that in the Jet game, that was for sure. So I was surprised that they let Tyree Phillips go. That was my other one that I uh, was surprised about. And um, the only other thing is I think the O-line is needy. I hope we pick some somebody up. Uh, Quisenberry uh, was let go by Buffalo. Um, you know, I didn't do a deep dive on him. Uh, but He played he almost half good... the snaps in Buffalo last year, and yeah, I'm sure yeah. the Giants people know about him. Did he come over yeah. from – where did he come over before he was in Buffalo? I'm trying to remember. Was he at oh, yeah. AFC North maybe? I don't remember. Yeah, I think it was that. Chicago. I don't know, somebody like that. Uh, and then uh, DNs are needy, but I guess we might have traded for someone, so that probably would help. But uh, right now, tackle-wise, we only got three guys. And if 
God forbid, if Thomas ever goes down and we got Pert in there, oh, I don't know, guys. I, I'm worried. And I, I just one last thing. Uh, Miller time was cut by the Packers, so there is a possibility he could be back on our practice squad since we lost Matrix. And uh, and we also we don't know what's going on with Sweeney. You so, mean you uh, mean Myrick? Uh, yeah, my well, I call him Matrix. What, why do you call him <laughs> Matrix? I don't have no idea. Why do you call him? I want to know. Why do you call him Matrix? Matrix is kind of like the guy who disappears into the other spaces and stuff. You know the oh boy. Matrix. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Like Joe okay, Noah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look, I, I think Matrix is a cool oh. nickname. Sean Marion was the Matrix back yeah. in the day, but I, I don't see Chris Myrick like doing the flips off the walls like like just Joe was to, back in the day. Just to revisit this conversation about what kind of tackle could you find on the waiver wire? The two most prominent names at the position are Quisenberry and Logan Bruss. And Quisenberry, by the way, came into the league. He was a sixth-round pick all the way back in 2013. He's 33. Yeah. So he's been in the league a while. He's with the Texans and the Titans. And Br- and Bruss was a third-round pick of the Rams a couple of years ago. Got hurt, missed a year. He's basically a guard who they tried to convert to tackle and had a very rough preseason. Yeah, he's and they a- decided to cut him. I think he's a guard. That's what he's supposed to be and they tried to convert him to tackle and again it didn't work out well but but at least he's a third round pick so there's somewhat of a pedigree there but that's what we're talking about and so when you when you say hey Giants should go get a, a waiver a tackle honestly you're not gonna find much okay and bottom line here Paul maybe the position in all of football that's in highest demand is offensive tackle They just aren't a lot of 6'5", 320-pound guys with 34-inch arms that can stay in front of the best athletes in the world that weigh around 60 to 70 pounds less than they do. It's a hard position to play. No question. Just is. And teams know. They know flat out. Hey, if the guy's got anything, he's sticking on the roster. I mean, there's probably 28 teams in the league that are sitting here today saying, I wish we had better offensive line depth. No doubt. No doubt. It's just just what it is around the league. And, and, And to be fair to Pert, he did not do well in pass protection against the Jets. Yep. It was rough. Mm-hmm. His run blocking, though, was good. And prior to that, he had done well in the practices, specifically had done well with the uh, dual practice against the Lions. And so the Giants, obviously, they kept him as the third tackle. They feel like they couldn't do better, or they wouldn't they wouldn't have kept him on the team and cut Tyree Phillips. All right, let's go to uh, Tom in Stratford. He is up next here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Then we'll get to you out in L.A., Daz. Tom, what's going on? Hi, gentlemen. Um, John, I just want to say that was a great podcast you had with the um, the Lions GM, I think it was. Vikings. Vikings. We're going through the uh... – oh, okay. And that was uh, really informative. So um, um, if, if anyone really wants to know how the waiver process works – Listen to that podcast. Yeah, yeah by the way, just so the, um, just, just Tom, I just want to make sure the folks know which, what you're talking about here. So on Monday, we put up a Giants Huddle podcast. It's still on the Huddle podcast feed. Go find it. Uh, favorite podcast platform, Giants.com, Giants mobile app. Uh, interviewed uh, Rick Spielman, the former longtime GM of the Vikings. And we probably went around 40 minutes, and 30 of it was just what it is like going into cut day, the, you know, <laughs> just the, the pattern of it. And all that oh. stuff. So it was it was as into the weeds as you could possibly get. Oh my God! I had to take notes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like wow, you almost need a PhD to go through this. But um, and also, I wanted to ask you, John. Every time someone asks you like a really obscure question, you just start, start typing away on your uh, laptop, and you come up with the answer in like five seconds. Where do you go to get this stuff? The internet. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a special website, or is it? Uh... I mean, honestly, Tom, it depends on the question. Um, if it's like oh, okay. snap count stuff, I usually use PFF for that. They're really good with their snap counts, position by position. Oh, okay. um, Pro Football Reference is great for historical statistics. That's where I go for that. And then, if you're looking for biographical information, I, I know it's not you know usually the most accurate sometimes, but Wikipedia is always a good place to go for biographical data. Okay. So those are, depending okay. on what people are asking for, that's usually what I'm looking at. Yeah, I mean, okay. and you, uh, you, you, you can also, quick. just so you know, you can find guys who are around the league for a while, veterans. If you do a quick Google on them, like let's say a guy was cut by the Chiefs last year, Google will often still has his Chiefs bio. Yeah. 
on on that that site because it's still lingering. The remnants are still lingering on the web, and you can find it. Now, I'm going to give away Paul's secret here because I know he doesn't want to do it, but I'll do it. Paul actually has a complete Encyclopedia Britannica set under the desk here, and whenever he needs anything, he just bends down, and he takes the encyclopedia out, and that's how he gets his information. Okay. <laughs> old school. <laughs> old school. Hey, what, nothing wrong with old school. Um, Indeed. Listen, one other, two other things. Um, when last year's draft, I seem to recall that there was um, word out that Bellinger had no drops during his college career. Am I remembering correctly? I remember him being uh, labeled as having very good hands, no drops. I think the number was very small on like the single digits. I don't know okay. if there was no drops. It might have been like two. It was it was okay. a ridiculously low number, as I recall the conversations. Maybe I'm thinking there was no drops during the senior season. I don't know, but. I, I know he came out with a reputation of good hands, but yes. also, did you guys listen to the show yesterday? Yeah, I was in the room for that. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, I just wanted to, you know, extend um, what I said yesterday about you know, Joy being a Giants fan. It, it extends part of the reasons this show and you guys and, and everything you do for us and everything well, you. Uh, you share with us, and it's just it's awesome. And it's great being a Giants fan. And also, it's great that my star quarterback and star defensive player don't uh, simulate smoking a doobie. <laughs> Who did that? Anyway. Did I miss that? Who did that? Uh, well, if, if you okay. well, uh, the other team. The, in you York. mean the guy down the parkway? I have not watched Hard Knocks yet this week. I have not gotten yeah. to that yeah, episode. Yeah. I heard about it. It was in the it was in the post. So. <laughs> oh, I got you. Yeah, I didn't read that. Thank yeah. you, Tom. But Appreciate anyway, the call, man. Thank you, guys. So, have a great day. I looked up Bellinger, by the way, in terms of drops. Again, this is PFF's charting. Uh, no drops in 2021 in his final season at San Diego State. So, okay. Tom, you did remember that correctly. Uh, two in 2020, one in 2019. So that's what they have him tracked for those three years. Yeah. Now he wasn't thrown to a ton no he okay was not. but he was known to have good hands 42 targets 33 targets and 25 targets so yeah not exactly a, a a guy they threw to a lot but evidence was good hands and we've seen my gosh have we seen him drop a pass here not this summer no i don't think so nope. either I'm trying to remember even last season how many passes he dropped uh, not many, i'll look I that up think. on yeah. my chart yeah. while you take the next call check your old school chart paul's gonna get his encyclopedia out all right let's go to daz out in la he's up next what's up daz Hey, how you guys doing? What's up? Um, my first time calling, but I listen to you guys just about every morning. Uh, you guys do a really good job. Well, thank you for listening um, and calling in, Daz. What do you got for us? Absolutely. I uh, I wanted to touch on basically the the uh, Bellinger conversation that you guys were just having, really, um, and just the tremendous value. I mean, I think you guys really understand the the value that we get with Bellinger, but when I when I look at how he played last season as a rookie, and again we just discussed his his lack of drops, him being a dual threat. I mean, when we think about these other tight ends, it's like, oh, this tight end is really good at blocking, and this other tight end is really good at catching. And for him to be such a quality dual threat and do what he did in his rookie season, his uh, his injury really gets under my skin last year because it was such a niche injury, like literally getting his face broken. It was a freak thing. It was a freak thing. Absolutely. Yeah, so and I, and I obviously that stunted his growth for the season that year, but all I could think about was the potential that he could have reached or how he was ascending at that time and I just think that we're we're really in store to see Daniel Bellinger really make a name for himself and make himself somewhat of a superstar this coming season. Yeah, see Daz, the way I see Bellinger, I don't know if he's ever going to be that tight end that catches 70 balls for you. I'm just not sure he has the twitch for that, even though he has the size and maybe straight-ahead speed for it, especially with someone like Darren Waller on the team. But, and this is a big but, and I don't mean to, to try to reduce his value because that's not what I'm doing here. There aren't that many really good two-way tight ends in the league anymore. Guys that can that's use right. as a solid receiver, but also is not just a solid but an above-average blocker. And I thought Bellinger as a blocker last year was excellent. And I think as a compliment to a guy like Waller. I think he's perfect. He gives you all sorts of freedom in terms of formation. You can use him as a fullback. You can use him as an H-back. You can use him as an inline tight end. And when teams are worried about you throwing the ball and they're in nickel or dime, well, if you run behind, and I'm not just saying as like a backside blocker, you could run behind Bellinger, and mm -hmm. if you get him on a nickel corner, right, in a blocking assignment, that's a huge advantage for you. He's going to mm -hmm. wipe that guy out. 
So a big part of the NFL now, Daz, and I think you're hitting this on the head, is are you good enough to take advantage of defenses when they play you a certain way? So if a team's going to put eight men in the box, are you good enough to make them pay by going to the passing game and going over the top? If a team goes light boxes against you, which is what most defenses are doing nowadays with more quarters and cover two and two safeties deep, well, do you have the personnel to say, all right, well, we're going to pound the living you-know-what out of you, and we're going to make you come out of those shell coverages. And Bellinger, as a tight end, whether he's your single tight end in 11 personnel or one of your two tight ends in 12 personnel, he's a guy that can punish small linebackers, safeties, and corners in the run game. So that's where I think Bellinger's value comes in, and I think all NFL teams are looking for a guy like him that can help you be a team that can do it with the run and in the pass, depending on what you know, defense is being shown to you on any given His play. physicality gives you an opportunity to use a matchup tight end, if you will, mm-hmm. where you don't just have to go with Waller being involved in the passing game. And the other thing, too, about Bellinger, the one drop I have him down for was against Washington last year. It was, a, if- it was a third down pass, which would have been a first down. That was the only drop that I had. PFF has the same thing. One drop against Washington. It's probably the same. Hey, they got something right. Good for them. Yeah, I mean, you more and more, you and PFF are just always on the same page. Oh, please don't say that. I'm going to get you hired by them on the side. In any any event. (laughs) uh, No, but but the the other part about about Bellinger is that I always thought he was Jake Ballard 2.0. I'm thinking now there may be a little more upside. He may wind up even being more than Jake Ballard. I, th- I think he's a better athlete than Ballard. Yeah, was. yeah, I concur. Okay. And he's developed that, and with the strength that he's added, um, yeah, I, th- I think maybe there's a higher upside there. And what round was he drafted in exactly? Bellinger was a fourth, fourth right? Yeah, he was a hundred uh, twelfth pick overall in twenty twenty two, fourth round pick. Wow, tremendous. Well, that's all I have for today, boys. Appreciate you guys uh, taking the call. Daz, we appreciate you. And, guys, we love getting new names and, and, and voices on, on the air. I know during the regular season we get a lot more new folks, but please, guys, get you in. Remember, we have a limit. It's only two calls a week, so we have plenty of open lines. And if we get to the regular season, we might drop back down to one, quite frankly, if we're getting – you know, we're finding people having trouble getting in. But you want to make sure we give everybody a chance to get in. And mm-hmm. our regulars have ample opportunity during the offseason to get their, their points out there. So we'll see. We might reduce everyone to back down to one call a week, depending on how it goes. But the more and more new names we're getting, and the more and more we get other people calling in, the more we'll, we'll try to make sure we spread the wealth and make sure we get everybody Can in. we put that restriction in for Charlie no matter what? Everyone gets treated the same. <laughs> I know. Equal opportunity. Charlie was actually good today. You know that, Charlie? Thank, thanks that for is, rebounding. That is the second of the week, though. Okay. Ah, too bad. Well, we only have one more day with call, so Charlie actually timed that out pretty well. Hey, Giant fans, the 2023 NFL schedule is out. Single-game tickets are on sale now. Don't miss the Giants at MetLife Stadium this season. Visit Giants.com slash tickets to secure your seat. I don't even need to do the Giants TV or Giants huddle reads because our two callers actually gave good promos for those. Wasn't that great? So I'm going to skip those. Don't forget to run or walk with Giants legends. The Giants Foundation will host a 5K Racing Kids Run presented by Quest on Sunday, October 8th at 9 a.m. at MetLife Stadium. Net proceeds will benefit the Giants Foundation. All participants will receive a commemorative t-shirt after the race. Stay for a post-race festival with appearances by Giants legends and a live DJ. Register now with Giants.com slash 5K. And finally, you can still take your fandom to the next level the regular season is not here you still have time to get a season ticket membership bro you only about 10 days to go so make sure you get on the line get online get on the phone and you can become connected to the club all year round not just on game days memberships are available for the 2023 season to learn more about all the exclusive member benefits go to giants.com slash tickets and limited inventory is available but you still have time to get in make sure you do it all right, let's go back to the phones at 201-939-4513. Tim is in Charleston. He's up next. Hey, Tim. Hey, guys. Good to talk to you. I'm sitting here taking an early break from work so I can call in in my car being pelted by rain from the outer bands of Adelia. So last year I called you once when we were actually in the midst of, re- of the hurricane. And now it's be safe. Anymore. Yes, anyway, Tim. And by the way, you be yeah. safe, Tim, and all of our listeners down there in Florida. You guys be safe as well. Yeah, those are the ones I'm worried about. Yep. We're closing at three, so that's cool. Um Anyhow, so the, I had two well, – really, it's all around the same thing. This one fifty-three third spot that they left open. Now, John, am I wrong? Did you hint there might be another shoe to drop, maybe somebody coming in from outside? Well, I know you can't yeah, I mean, specifics, but. I mean, there were, there were reports yesterday about a trade the, uh, the Giants were going to make. So, 
Um, oh, okay. That I is that. yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Look, uh, uh, we mentioned on yesterday's show, so there were reports that the Giants uh, traded for Boogie Basham. So that has not oh, become oh, official okay. yet. That's... That would be number oh, fifty-three. That, but that, that is, that, but that is not yet official yet. Tim, uh, uh, just to clarify, I don't want people to think that we're trying to hide something behind a curtain. Uh, A deal cannot be official or a signing cannot be official until the deal is actually signed in ink on paper and the guy has passed his his physical. That's the most important. Okay. And you can't do the actual signing on the paper until the physical was passed. So, So there are technicalities as to why we can't necessarily announce something or say something because it isn't done until it's done. Yeah. I didn't, you know, it's funny. I didn't even notice that he wasn't on the 52 guys listed. It didn't, it didn't click in my head. I was going to ask, I was going to put out the conjecture there that they might keep that spot open, you know, and expose somebody like a Beavers or a Fox to a waiver claim now while there's hundreds of guys out there if they thought they were going to have to do it after they made other moves to try to, because I guess it, it, it's probably, you figure maybe there's a little less chance of a guy getting claimed when there's hundreds of them available, but if you do it a couple of days later and try to get them on your practice squad, you might lose that. No, time. Tim, you're I right. It's funny. Some of that to, in it. Talking to Rick Spielman on Monday, I actually asked him, as you remember, the Giants had released a couple guys early, like a Colin Johnson. I said to him, well, what are some of the reasons you do that? And he says, yeah, you want to help the guys out, better chance of them getting with another team if they're available earlier. And he said, look, usually the guys you release early, you do – are probably not interested in bringing back on your practice squad. He says, look, you want to sneak as many guys into that like 200 name list as possible that comes out on Tuesday. Right. And you have a better right. chance of your guy getting overlooked on Tuesday than you would if you release them early on Monday or to your point, a couple days later on a Thursday or something like that. We've got about 25 minutes or so, right, John? Is it 12 or is it 4 o'clock No, it's 12 o'clock today. 12 o'clock today. 12 o'clock today. At 12 o'clock, teams can start adding practice squad guys or making the IR moves or all that other stuff we talked about. No, but when does the waivers start? Is waivers at 12? 12, 12 o'clock. Is waivers? No, they end. Waivers, waivers end at 12 o'clock. Yes, I know, but, but that, that's when all the waiver claims are going to come yes. out at 12 o'clock. Yes, okay, I get yes, okay. which will be just about 30 seconds after we sign off. Yes, I, I wasn't sure <laughs> and, if it was 24 league, hours because it was not 4 for o'clock this. yesterday. This is, this is 12 o'clock For, for this, okay. it's 12 o'clock. Thank you. I wasn't so, aware and of that. The, and, the le- and the league starts announcing them almost immediately, you're saying? Usually those transactions get out there pretty quick. They'll, they'll, yeah. You'll find yeah. ways that they'll leak out on the Internet, and in some cases right. the teams will let you know quicker than others, but – we will right. see. Because remember, the teams Can have I... to get in their claims, Tim, just so people understand how it works, by noon today. Then the league has to sort it out based on waiver order what players get awarded You'd to like what You'd like to teams. think they have a computer that can help no, them I'm, out I'm sure, that. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm, sure I'm sure they do, but they still got to put all the names into yes. the system and see what gets spit out. Yes, yes. Now, when, it, when a team claims somebody who's waived, they have to add them to the 53? Yes. yes. At this, Minimum of three weeks, that, I believe. This, he has to be on the 53 and that, and, for three weeks. Minimum. Okay, and that's also true during the regular season, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hey, thanks, guys. You, oh, you said you only have one more show. Would that be tomorrow? And oh, whoa, whoa, no. We are, we are, we are live tomorrow, but Friday is going to be and a then, recorded show. It is not a live okay. show. We did like right. probably like an hour and fifteen minute NFL preview. It was, it was pretty extensive. It was a good cool. show. We actually recorded that this yeah. morning. Lance Paul and I gave all our predictions, so that was fun. Tomorrow's my day off, and usually I like to call in if I have something interesting to say. I'll talk to you again tomorrow. Well, you have. You, you know who's going to be on? Yeah, you have Lance and Casillas tomorrow. Oh, that fun fun. I love Jonathan. Yep. We'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Tim. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Oh, boy. Thank you. Thank you so much for the phone call. 201-939-4513 is our phone number on Big Blue Kickoff. Tim Live. just slipping the dagger. Wow. That was savage. All right. Let's go to uh, Ralph in New Jersey. Ralph, I expect that from people from New Jersey, not from friendly South Carolina. Ralph, what's going on, man? Hey, what's going on, John and Paul? How y'all doing? We're Hello. good, dude. How are you? I hope you're well. Good, good. Um, I'm a long-time listener. This is probably my second time calling. I think I've been listening to the show since, like, Anita Marks was on the show. That was, a long, that was like, what, 2016? Uh, probably. No, that's awesome. Hey, Ralph, glad, glad for you to stick with yeah, us. Yeah, thank you for sticking with us, man. We appreciate it. <laughs> yes, sir. But uh, I got a point, two couple, a couple points to make. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, so who do you think will have the most impact on offense and on defense as far as most, like, yardage on offense 
because we signed guys like Darren Waller and whatnot, so I was wondering guys like uh, Bellinger would have more opportunity. So I was wondering. Well, well, Bar- think Barkley's going to lead this team in the total yards from scrimmage. Yes, I agree okay. with that. I will say this, though. I, here's my, I think the two most impactful players on each side of the ball, I think Darren Waller might be the most important player on this whole offense, aside from, obviously, the play of the quarterback is always the most important thing, right? But they need Waller to be healthy and to be a mismatch player in my lingo, a headache player in Datino's language, and that's what they need him to be. And yep. a running back can be that too, but it's hard to for a running back to be that type of target in the passing game. But a tight end in the sure. modern NFL can be that guy. So for me, it's Waller on offense and on defense, it's – you're asking most impactful, so not most not most pivotal. I would say the most important and impact the most impactful player on defense is still Dexter Lawrence. Look, he draws double teams up front. He helps you in the run game. The interior pass rush he can uh, give you consistently. The amount of pressures he got from the nose tackle position last year by far led the NFL. Right. And though those to me are the two most impact again aside from the quarterback are the two most impactful players on offense and defense. Well, yeah, I don't. Got? I don't have a problem with Dexter Lawrence. I think you would like to see Kayvon Thibodeau become a headache player on defense. He needs to take that to the next level. He to needs do to get that. there. Correct. He's not there yet. You'd like him to be. And on offense, I still think that Barkley and Waller are both headache players. So I, no, I agree with you know, though. There, there isn't any doubt that Barkley is a mismatch headache player. There is. I just think. With the way the modern NFL works, I'm going to take the pass catcher before I take the guy that runs the ball. That's that's okay. Yeah. Right, right. Then my side question is, because of those guys, so because of those guys' presence, what other guys will have the most opportunity because of those guys? Oh, that that that's a really good question, Ralph. I would say offensively. You have an easy answer, Paul. While I think about this. I think. Paris Campbell mm. is an outstanding route runner who has glue for hands and can play a lot of slot. He could also do some stuff outside, but he's probably going to see a lot of slot too. I want to say Wanda Robinson for the same reason. I just don't know how healthy he's going to be. This right. Year. Uh, I think Jalen Hyatt too. Look, Waller's going to attract safeties and guys over the middle, and that's going to create maybe some space over the top for a guy like Hyatt. So I think Hyatt's going to have on offense too. See, part of part of my thinking is that if the Giants start to send guys like Hyatt or Slayton uh, or, or or even Waller downfield, which Campbell, you can do, that, man, Campbell too. Well, you can, but I see. I think they're going to use Campbell a lot underneath as a yak guy. I totally agree. Yeah, I think that's his primary role. I agree with you. 100%. And if the other guys are taking defensive backs and linebackers back further in the defense, that means more space. No, I agree. for Campbell. Hundred percent agree. That's that would be my thought. And then defense, who could Dexter Lawrence? I'm going to go Aziz Ojolari. I, you know, Paul talked about Aziz. Kayvon Thibodeau. I think Aziz in his third year, if you look at his, you know, rate numbers Stay last year. Stay on the year, field. I know he's been healthy all all summer. If you look at yeah. his rate numbers last year, you know, pressure percentage, you know, pressures per you know rush attempt, sacks per rush attempt, nice. they were phenomenal and. Look, he's got that juice and that bendiness and that flexibility mm-hmm. off the edge. I think you're looking at Ojolari there. I, I think he's going to lead the Giants in sacks this year. So I'm going to go Ojolari. I will say this. If Dexter Lawrence is still Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams has a healthy season, boy, Bobby Okereke is going to have a lot of freedom to oh, do some things that, from the middle I, I think, I think that's a good one, too. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, guys. Appreciate the call, man. Good question. I like that question. Yeah. 201-939-4513. Let's go to Rich down in Florida. Rich, I hope you're staying safe down there, man. Oh, yeah. We, uh, we're we in Satellite Beach. So thankfully, we just got some win, uh, John and, and Paul. Just wanted to say keep up the great work. Great show, as always. Really enjoy all the normal regulars calling in. <laughs> and I've told you guys, you're, you guys are the best. But a shout-out to, to, to a new, uh, brand-new BBKL listener and part of the joining the BBKL family, um, Dr. John and – in uh, Atlanta, longtime Giants fan, and uh, he's the brother of Dr. Mike, who's in Northern Virginia, is also live uh, listening, longtime listener, longtime Giants fan. So, cool. Want to shout out to Dr. John in Atlanta. Very good, Rich. I got curiosity, Rich. So, just so I'm clear on the hurricane stuff, it's hitting the Gulf side of Florida, correct? So, you're on the Atlantic Ocean side of Florida. Is that accurate? That's correct. We okay. live in we have we uh, I live in Virginia and then down here also. Um, 
the hurricane hit uh, for the first time in history the what's called the Big Bend area in uh, the Gulf of Mexico on right. the western side of Florida's Category 3. So right now, even though we did our hurricane prep, it's cloudy out because we live right on the beach. It's cloudy out and in the 15 knot wind, and they're predicting some rain bands, but we've been really blessed. I mean, we got hit twice last year in November with Ian and another one. Right. It right. just totally eroded the beach. So um, I've been through a lot of hurricanes and typhoons and earthquakes in the Air Force. You, you just you just take everything very, very seriously. Well, and, and, Rich, but, uh, and, and Rich, God willing, it seems like, you know, Florida has become very prepared for this sort of stuff. I know last year they did a pretty good job recovering from that stuff, so hopefully that's the case again this year. Yeah, last year, I mean, uh, uh, Fort Myers just got just eradicated. It's gonna take, it takes years, but Florida, I mean, uh, the governor is awesome, a lot of preparedness, so it's just the way of, way of life down here. And I can tell you, uh, after, you know, I've been a Giants fan since 61, seen every game, you know that. Uh, we're cautiously optimistic, cautiously optimistic, and number one, prayers for health, because hopefully this year, you know, it seems like we're bit every year by these doggone injuries. Look at what happened last year with all those wide receiver injuries. But hopefully, if these guys stay healthy, I'm, they got a shot. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Mike, who's listening right now, is telling me, put it down in your wallet. They got a good chance of beating Dallas. But, you know, they do. The Giant fans, yeah, I just, but their record against those teams just is awful. And so I'm, you know, beating Dallas is just incredible. No, Rich, I, I Rich, that's the thing. That That's why a lot of Giant fans have gotten mad at me this offseason with, with the way I've looked at this. But I'm at the stage where you are, where I need to, it needs to be shown to me that they can do it before they did it. Because it's been so many years where they haven't been able to be Philly. They haven't been able to be Dallas. I Like I said, I think they've closed the talent gap a ton. But I need to see it, and then I'll believe it. I think they can. I think it's possible. I think they got a real good chance of winning the first game of the year at home, Dallas, Sunday night football. But maybe I've just been mentally scarred by the past four or five years. I don't know what it is, but I want to see them do it. And I think they can this year. I really do believe they can this year for the first time Just in a while. remember this. A high tide always becomes a low tide eventually. Sure. <laughs> oh, that prophetic uh, Godfather Dottino. I love it. But just remember, uh, John, we go back we go back even farther than the Godfather Dottino. Even in, like, the 86 season, that was a great team. They had trouble beating Philly. They had trouble beating Philly. Certain teams are it's like know. off. You get a mental block. And uh, we were a better team than Philly back in 86. And it's just it's a mental block. And, and the thing this year, as we all know, they were really good last year. They they played above the X's and O's. They got more talent this year, but they got to get a better, and, we, you know, you guys have talked about it. They got to get a better record than that division. If if they're going to go to the playoffs, they got to at least, you know, be 500 in the division. No, yeah, it's 100%. Yeah, Rich, and, and thanks a lot for the call. Great got stuff. To. And, again, be safe down there. To make the playoffs, minimum 3-3. Three and three. If you want to win double-digit wins and challenge for the division title, you got to win four. Yeah. That's it. That's the, uh, the deal's official now, John. Thank you. Uh, it, ha- it has been done. Uh, the Giants getting Boogie Basham from the Bills. Carlos Basham is his official name, Bob. Yes, Carlos Basham Jr. Oh, he's a junior. Yes, I he's a, about that. he That's is right. a junior. Uh, he was a second-round pick back in 2021. And they also get a, a seventh-rounder in 2025, and they ship the Bills their sixth-rounder in 2025. All right, so most importantly now, the Giants still have not acquired an additional 2024 seventh rounder, so we might have to stick around to the end of the seventh round on draft yeah. this year. <laughs> this is what this is what we're tracking here. <laughs> so so now we know there is a a real 53rd player on the roster and in approximately 8 minutes the uh the frenzy We'll, uh, we'll open the doors to the practice squads, and we'll see what happens then. Yeah, so he was the 61st overall pick, end of the second round for the for the Buffalo Bills back in 2021. We talked about him a lot. He's kind of he's one of those power defensive ends, mm-hmm. edge players. He's not like, you know, the quick, bendy, Brian Burns type. No, he's more of that's your, not him. You know, if you think of like those old school Patriot defensive end types, the, uh, you know, uh, the you know, Van Oy, those type of guys that are going to, you know, push the depth of the pocket. Remember, he dropped. He was considered a late first-round pick. Mm-hmm. And then he tested very poorly at the combine. Correct. So, and he just hasn't been able. He's had two and a half sacks, I think, right in his NFL career or something uh, like I that. I think four. four two in each season, Two in each season, that's what it was. I'm sorry. Thank you. So he's a guy that you hope. To me, he's kind of your Jihad Ward type 
where he's going to be a guy that's going to set the edge for you, be a powerful player, but he's not going to be like that bendy speed guy to get around the edge. He he is a power guy. Um, he, to me, projected as a defensive end in a 4-3. Yep, I agree. Who could also play three technique defensive tackle he's in a 4-3. Just keep in mind, like, Kayvon Thibodeau's 255. He's 280. He's 280. Different type of guy. Different type of guy. And th- and that's around what Jihad Ward is, too. Same deal. And I think the issue for me is that when you take a guy that high, even though he was a second-round pick. And a late second again. You're probably thinking he's going to get eight or nine sacks or seven or eight sacks. Right. But that's not what Boogie Basham is. He's got a really good motor. Uh, I know the scout who scouted him. Love his character. Love his intelligence. Uh, clean living guy. Good teammate. Smart player. Um, has to add to his repertoire. He needs more moves, more counters, and has to add some more some more technique to his game. But he is just one of those good, solid defensive ends that, that you're going to put on the field and is not going to make a lot of ESPN highlights. That's not what he's going to do. And I think sometimes when you pick a guy that high, you're expecting a lot more stats than you get from him. He's a guy who you may not notice in the highlights, but is going to be a good, solid football player. I, you know, blue collar coaches love yeah. guys like this. And you know what, Paul? I must be confusing him with someone else because I'm looking. He didn't do the combine. Everything was from his pro day. I must the, be. Then con- the pro day wasn't very good because you know what? It wasn't bad though. Four, five, nine, forty yard dash. But for a guy who was anticipated to be one of the lead like defensive, yeah, but ends, a two seventy five, four, five, nine is pretty good. A ten foot broad, a thirty four inch vert, seven one three three cone. Those aren't. I might, maybe I'm. Am I confusing him with a different second round lineman? I don't I know. Don't maybe know that. those numbers are not bad that I'm looking at right here. But They're not. When because as you had said, some people thought he would be a late first rounder, yeah. and when he dropped, the reasoning was that he did not necessarily test as well. Yeah. Now I'm not saying those numbers are horrible, but they're not. They're not. They're not, they're not elite. They're not premier. Right. Well, correct. I agree, I agree with you. Mm-hmm. Now, again, I believe because he's in his third season with the uh, you know in the NFL, Joe Shane and the the Giants you know transfer Bills coaches know an awful lot about him, and for whatever reason, okay, that it didn't work out there because he was well short of expectation or the scheme wasn't right or for whatever the case may be, uh. I don't think the Giants are going into this blindly. They're acquiring a player yeah, of who they know enough about to say, you know what, we think we can get something out of him. Yeah, and I think he's a guy that you'll fit into a specific role there in terms of how you're going to want to use him. I, I do think he is a package player. And by the way, there's no guarantee that he, you know, maybe he's one of the guys that's not active on game day too, depending on the week and the game plan and who they're playing. That's also this possible. This all goes back to the kaleidoscope defense yep. by Wink, mm-hmm. where he's matching up certain players and certain systems against certain schemes. All right, let's go back to the phones. Our final call of the show is Scott in New Mexico. He'll wrap us up today. Hi, Scott. Hi, guys. How you doing today? What's up? First of all, before I get to my main point, uh, every year, uh, thanks to Paul, I donate to the J Fund. And, oh, that's great. Uh, and this year, I'm going to do it in in honor of the BBK crew because I love the show so much that I thought you guys deserved that. No, thank, thank you, so you Scott. And by the way, folks, if you guys are out there and you're looking for a, a charity to donate to, the J Fund is an excellent choice. They run lean. And when I say they run lean, so many of their dollars, I mean, I don't think, All of I don't, them. well, I mean, obviously, to put, use the money to put on some events and stuff like yes, that. Yes, yes. So, but, right. but as many dollars as they can, a high percentage goes to, and again, for people that don't know, they basically help fund the families and parents of children that are dealing mm-hmm. with disease or cancer or some other issue where, you know, the parents have to take care of their children. They can't go to work. So the J Fund steps in. They help pay the bills stuff. for those right. for those families. So if you guys are looking for it, go donate to the J Fund. It's, it's Tom Coughlin created it. Uh, uh, Jay McGillis, correct? Yes. He's yes. a player Boston that he coached at Boston College that uh, unfortunately uh, passed away from cancer. So. And just this week, and I put it up on my Twitter, if you want to get a chance to take a look at it, Tom Coughlin's J Fund and Tackle Kids Cancer, the Eli Manning charity yeah, who that helps children with works, cancer works with Hackensack up there for Hackensack that. Hackensack University mm-hmm. Medical Center. Yep. They have now combined to, uh, to c- corral their efforts together 
to help fight all kinds of, of horrible things that, that, that go on with cancer and the families and so forth and so on. So great, great causes, and we thank you so much for uh, bringing that up. I'm going to okay. retweet that for the folks out there right now. Too. Okay, sounds good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually got a personal note from, um, which I was surprised from uh, Tom Coughlin. That doesn't surprise me it. at all. And so uh, it was kind of uh, rather nice for my wife and I to receive it. Anyways, getting back to uh, the situation, now that the dust is settled, uh, I agree with you 100%, John, in regards to having Waller being the most impactful player. You look at all the tight ends in the league, the people that score, uh, you know, with Andrews and uh, Kelsey and Goddard, you can go down the list. Uh, we have a player now that's going to be in the – probably the most difficult to cover and I think that's going to uh, really create a lot of angst for a lot of teams and so that's going to help tremendously I disagree with you on the most impactful uh, player on the defense I think strangely enough that not Dexter Lawrence well I'm, I'm, look, Scott I'm sorry your, your phone literally cut out as you said the name oh, okay. who, who did you pick uh, Deontay Banks Deontay Banks okay well I, I think he might be the most pivotal I'm not sure if he's going to be the most impactful, though. Like him and Trey Hawkins, if you want to look at, like, a fulcrum point of how good this Giants team is going to be this year, look no further than those two starting rookie cornerbacks. They are going to dictate a whole lot of how well this season goes, (laughs) good or bad. (laughs) Right. Uh, My main point, and then I'll let you – I know you're short on time, so I'm a bit off the air. But uh, my main point is this. Now that uh, they have the offensive line uh, and they have the players that they want, I'm a little nervous about the two starting guards. Uh, and the reason I say that, I, where you get the most, or where the most problems exist is if you get a pass rush up the middle, you have a rookie center, and you have, I'm going to assume for a second it's Bredesen and Glowinski. They're both good, but they're not great. And even Quentin Nelson, who was the best player in the league a couple of years ago, had a terrible time last year. So, uh, you know, guards are kind of hit and miss sometimes. But do you feel confident that they have a player in case one of those guys go down on the roster right now that can fill in and do a credible job? Because if Daniel Jones gets a pass rush up the middle, that's going to go back into the same format they had last year where Daniel rolls out and starts to run. And the whole idea, I think, this year is to be able to utilize the weapons he has so my, my problems are not with the tackles. It's with the two inside guards. I wanted to get your opinion, or are there any moves? I know it's late, as Paul said. They're going to, uh, you know, 12 o'clock is the deadline. Do you think any more moves will be made at the guard position? And that's the question I had, and I'll take it off to your guys. Thanks, Thanks Scott. Scott, Azuto's been running neck and neck with Bredesen throughout the preseason and training camp, and if Bredesen starts against Dallas – I would say the biggest reason is because of his experience against Dallas's very multiple-looking front. I, I you know, I, no, I, I don't think there's a tremendous drop-off there other than experience. Azudu is, is a guy that they think very highly of. And quite honestly, I know McKeithen has had very, very, very few reps, but they think very highly of him, John. They think he's got a future in this league. They do, and I, I think – and then you have Shane Lemieux, obviously, who's a guy that's been here a few had a, years. And too. had a really good camp this year. Yeah, well, he stayed healthy. That was the most important thing for sure. So they, they've got bodies at the guard spot. I, I would, I agree with you. There are no all pros there. No one's going to confuse the Giants' guards with all pros. Yeah, I think you have a bunch of guys that can give you a similar level of play. The question is that level of play as high as you want it to be to deal with teams like Dallas and San Francisco and those other – Philly, Washington, those other great pass rushers you're going to be facing this year. There are always going to be specific matchups that will give your guys more trouble. That's just the way it is. I mean, for years when the Giants had Bart Oates and then Sean O'Hara as the center in the middle of their line, both of those guys for their time were considered undersized centers. Sure. So when they went up against a team – that had a William Refrigerator Perry type or a Cortez Kennedy type of defensive tackle, well, that was a concern that particular week for them. And John Michael Schmitz isn't the biggest guy either, by the way. He's no. not. He's not a. He's not a. Well, I would consider he's a big he's tackle. Thick. Yeah, he's, 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 he's sturdy. He's sturdy mm-hmm. at center. Um, so, in in answer to your question, Scott, I do think that there may be some particular matchups that the interior line may have more difficulty against. 
But I think on the whole, I'm not really worried about the uh, the talent level at guard. No, 100%. And just FYI, Schmidt's at the combine. And he's listed at 6'4", 3'10". At the combine, he weighed in at, uh, what's the numbers here? 6'3", and as the auto video plays, 301 pounds. So that's the NFL.com auto video play. Sorry about that. But yeah, 6'3", uh, 301 are, at the NFL What are they combine. listing him at here today? That's a good question. What is he listed at the, on the roster? What do you got there? Where are, are you? Where are you? Here he is. Uh, 320. 320, wow. And they, and they do weigh these guys in. They do. So... Obviously, he's put on some beef since the combine. If he's a 320, that's not an undersized center at all. That is no, that's that is fine. A, that is a very good. That's size fine. NFL that's center, not a problem. Sure, hundred percent. And I'll tell you what, he doesn't look like. I oh no, he's he's well he's put solid. together. He's solid. He's well put together. You know, there's not a lot of uh, pound cake, you know, hanging over his uh, over his belt. <laughs> Paul, good stuff, my friend. <laughs> yeah, fun fun time. So tomorrow it's Lance and Casillas. And again, then we have our pre-recorded show coming your way on Friday, our NFL preview. And then we're back to 1230 next week as we hit our regular season thing. We will have a show live on Labor Day at 1230. We'll be here. We'll be working. So make sure you check it out on Giants.com and the Giants Mobile app and all your favorite podcast platforms. For Paul Dottino, I'm John Schmuck. We'll see you next time on Big Blue Kickoff Live.